All right. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so this is a new project uh, that I'm starting here. Um, my name is Rodolfo. I'm, a, you know, I'm a person. <laughs> I'm a person running a coffee project called Productor, and uh, we produce coffee in El Salvador. We're sourcing coffee in other countries, and we have our own importing company in Europe uh, in order to do direct trade. And uh, today's guest is one of uh, my favorite coffee people, Yaromir. Um, he's a client of ours from uh, Nordbeans. Um, yeah. Wow, that's really nice, man. Thank you. It's appreciated. Yeah, so, uh, so Yaromir, um, so you're not only in coffee, you do other stuff. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit about like the other stuff that you work with? So actually, there is a, I mean, there's no connection to coffee, like in terms of what it's about, but it's, I mean, what I do, I do project management. Uh, it's like, a, it's project, it, it has to do, it has to do with the uh, R&D projects. So these are usually large R&D projects uh, that um, get some form of uh, EU subsidy or something like that. So it's basically uh like getting other big teams from different environments to do one thing at a certain time in a certain way that they uh, told they're going to do it like two years ago so it's very so it's project management basically mm -hmm. uh it sort of helps me i think you know to do things in coffee because it's all different cultures and uh different uh you know time zones different uh like special tasks like logistics uh, you know uh sourcing and roasting and selling as well so it's mm -hmm. very so i do i'm not a specialist more like a generalist and things so yeah so uh, i think what i do uh in my other career it helps me uh do coffee better so mm -hmm. so that's yeah, what i would so, say about that so to kind of like explain this um you know like the the eu uh gives a lot of funds to to central and eastern europe and you guys are like specialists in the Czech Republic in um, designing projects that uh, can get uh, assigned EU funds, right? So like you design your own projects and you also help other other companies develop their own projects, right? Something like right, that. yeah, both of, yeah, both of those. I mean, some projects are we, we're involved like hands on. Some of them we're just trying to organize. So we're more like the paperwork kind of guy, but we're in both parts of that. Uh, with mm -hmm. different bodies and yeah it's it's very it's like all the long-term projects so uh, what i see in business generally uh, there's a lot of like short-term thinking so this is more like you design a project that should end in like three Sorry, years time I miss, I miss, uh, there, there's a lot of what type of thinking i kind of missed what you said uh like short term you know like uh, a lot of people really uh, you need to sell this buy this now and sell it as quick as possible these are more like strategic projects you know you, you design something that you're supposed to finish in three years and you actually have to finish it so so it helps with strategy i mean it's it's like r d projects so you know things go bonkers and you find out that what you thought you would be able to in it like you're not able to develop the ai or th things like that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and you're also a university teacher, right? Yeah, I teach uh, I teach uh, media war and conflict. So it's just mm -hmm. a one course uh, in, in the summer semester for yeah. like a small group of dedicated yeah. students that uh, you know that like to yeah. Yeah, get to know about weird stuff. Yeah, it's an amazing topic. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> war and politics and media. Um, you know, I guess that that's that gives us a lot of material to talk about, like in our kind of like personal exchanges, right? Um, so, so that's something I, I would like to get into. Uh, you know, as as a person that's like knowledgeable about world politics, um, you know, when when you get into coffee, you you have to deal with a lot of countries with like very particular um, you know political situations, right? Um, I mean, I, I would say that coffee mainly grows in very politically unstable countries, right? Um, like, what, what's your opinion? You know, like, th does it affect like your coffee purchasing, or like, how do you view like, you know, when you're like buying coffee from a, a, a country going through a conflict or you know, very difficult situation in terms of human rights or stuff like that? Um, you know, because it's sort of like, 
you're running a coffee business and you're not responsible for what's happening in that country. Um, but, you know, if, if you're like a person that's involved in politics, like, um, does it affect you somehow or? Yeah, first of all, it's interesting. I mean, uh, sometimes it's, 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 you know, the people who we work with, like uh, you or in other countries, uh, so it affects you somehow. I mean, you're not able to travel somewhere or you, you have trouble with logistics. And uh, for, for, from the client side, so we're usually trying to sell coffee ahead of time. And it's like, I, I really understand when, when the government in, I don't know, Ethiopia shuts down internet because it's the summer tests for school and there's pro, uh, protests, uh, which is really interesting to me always, like with the digital technology, how the governments are able, you know, to pull the cable and switch off internet anywhere they want. And the companies like sort of comply because they want to do business. So I always see like the, the very effect on, on the on the business partners we have, that's really interesting. I also get uh, good insights uh, from like the country. So it's not like I have to read the media, but I sometimes, you know, I mean, you know, Mati uh, from Cameroon, that's uh, really like conflict driven country. And I visited can, in two, in 2000. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Can you tell us a bit about like that project? Uh, so like people that don't know uh, Mati, uh, if you can tell us a little bit about what's going on in Cameroon and the coffee you work with there. Yeah, sure. So uh, Cameroon is, uh, so most of the coffee uh, you would drink as a specialty coffee that would be grown in East Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia. Uh, Cameroon is West Africa, but they have been growing coffee uh, for a long time. And there's like the countries actually, it's, I think it's, there's only two countries like that. It's Cameroon and Canada. It's English speaking and French speaking at the same time. Uh, there's different parts of countries that do that. And Mati Foncha, uh, it's, it's a very valued partner. Uh, so he, he's from the English speaking part. Uh, so all of our friends and clients are from the English, uh, English Cameroonians. And they have basically been undergoing a struggle on their rights to, I don't know, conduct uh, courts and, and government in English. So mm -hmm. what the French, uh, French uh, the, the BI is like the longest serving Africa's uh, president now. So, so the French domination sort of like uh, got stronger around there. There were some protests, I think, fall 2016, 17. I was there in... Uh, in 2017, so we had a project called like micro washing stations, basically Mati building that there's like three villages, one of them is called Belo, the other one is Shaw, and then there's Noni, and then he was building their like micro washing stations for, for the farmers to bring the cherries and train the staff to, you know, have oversight over the quality of the processing, and we were like sponsoring the sponsoring the building of the micro mill stations, this really tiny stations. Mm -hmm. And yeah, actually like three months after I was there, the, the Battle of Belo took place. You know, there were helicopters of the Cameroonian government and there's like insurgency uh, from the like separatists they called Ambazonians. And mm -hmm. like, I mean, like it, it was like a, almost like a full scale civil war in that region. It's now a little more muted, but I mean, like last year, so, so we were doing like this, uh, like origin update with Mati. So, hey, Mati, how are you? Could you please reply to some of our questions? And his reply was, I got kidnapped yesterday. They just let me go. I'm really tired. Can we talk tomorrow? <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like, it's like an everyday life for them. Uh, within the conflict, there was like shooting. I mean, Alex from... Uh, uh, I'm not sure who we work from now, but it's like I we whenever you I mean I have heard like gunshots at that you know at Cameroon and they they shot a guy so it's uh, I hear it's not very uncommon, so there were like military checkpoints and police checkpoints, mm -hmm. so you see it's in conflict environment it's like in different countries as well. But so what what happened was to the what happened to the micro mills? Like, but was any damage? Did any damage happen? Yeah, that, that there's like bullet holes in those and they're not operational. They mm -hmm. haven't been, and, and, and but there was like a there. If you Google, if you go to Wikipedia and follow the page, it's called Anglophone Crisis, so it's very well documented. So mm -hmm. I think Battle of Noni took place just months ago. It's one mm -hmm. of the places where where the micro mill is, so it's not operational. Unfortunately, we're not even able to buy the coffee. You know, like this year or last season, it's hard to export. Yeah, so the there, coffee. Like, are people still picking the coffee, or like? Yeah, they run. Like completely kind of like abandoned 
yeah some of them is are abandoned you know they're like hidden in their you know compounds and waiting to go uh, uh sometimes the government comes in sometimes it goes out so Cameroon has to really like well trained the special forces because in the north there's ISIS so really I mean if you put the north of Cameroon to Copenhagen the south would be in Napoli so it's like a really really wow. big country yeah. uh so, so sometimes it's like the way the maps are designed like it makes africa look smaller so yeah we can't really perceive that but yeah it's pretty big <laughs> so it's a very complex environment and, and actually like mati is i mean there's like this guy his name is ernest he's like the field operator so his car is uh, registered in yaounde that's the french capital and he speaks french and english so he's the only guy who can actually like travel to the english-speaking regions like pick up coffee and then bring it over the checkpoints because his car is registered in in the French speaking and he can speak French so he can get through the checkpoints. Uh, so it's very hard to just you know uh, transport coffee uh, from town to town. Uh, not so, even so do you think it. like is the government like suppressing coffee production in the sp English speaking side or? No, everything, the whole economy and, mm -hmm. and you know, everything. So it's coffee, it's just uh, one of the victims. Really. And is it like a kind of like a genocidal kind of like suppression? Mm, it's more political, I think. Uh, they're all Cameroonians after all, but it's more like uh, so they want them to basically not uh, try to there, separate from Cameroon and, uh, you know, be governed tribal, by different. tribal differences. Oh, I don't, I, I, yeah. honestly, I don't know. I, I yeah. Probably, yeah, but I don't think, mm -hmm. uh, I yeah, don't like, think it's, who, it's like. Who ended up learning them. English and, yeah, I guess like, yeah, colonial. And then at some point they just uh, all got stuck in a made up country, I guess. Or... And like you were actually, yeah, yeah, it's like that. It's like that. So originally the question was whether I use it for my teaching. So actually like I use this conflict. Mm -hmm. uh as a because when i teach conflict in media so it's it's what i opened the course with actually because like nobody in europe knows anything about the conflict mm -hmm. so it's like easy for me to student like pass the students to like i don't know like online media like respected media and social media and one group you know uh looks the data about the conflict only on social media the other one on like traditional media online and they compare the results what they find out because you know yeah. the social media is like always really you know so pro or anti it's very biased usually mm -hmm. and and like like bbc did a great piece on like the, the fact finding missions like you know the data journalism like where you really verify the info because whenever you post something online like somebody killed somebody in a village somebody would say like hey it's a different village you know it happened in 2018 so what i think is like a interesting uh like way how to do journalism these days is to you know really like do the fact finding um, and verify that the info that somebody puts out is right so that's that's one thing i'm trying to do like you know, when we're yeah. looking into something you know, so so I don't really I don't use Twitter, uh, but I use Instagram. And recently, I, I've run into like very political, kind of like uh, I would say like left wing revolutionary <laughs> Instagram accounts. Uh, I mean, which are all like really posting stuff about Kazakhstan right now that you don't. I mean, uh, you don't really see that much in in like traditional media. And it just seems like way more immediate to all of a sudden see, you know, like people beating up uh, soldiers and videos like that, that are just like getting posted immediately on Instagram. And, um, you know, but we, we don't get, <coughs> I guess, uh, you know, Kazakhstan, they have a bit more money because uh, you don't really see stuff like that coming out of Ethiopia, you know. Like maybe That's not right. Yeah. much, right? Like not so much access to to like nice phones that will record video and um, you know. Um, so that's uh, like what what do you think about what's going on in Ethiopia? Yeah, first of all, I think it's tragic. I mean, it's 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 the biggest like uh, I think one of the biggest human rights crisis in in the whole world right now, in mm -hmm. terms of like people actually suffering, you know, being hungry. Uh, sick and not be able to treat it uh, so it's really so there's like horrible stuff going on there's not much 
uh, not much you know about it. So, I mean, the journalists would be afraid to go there. So uh, maybe there's like, like telegram groups where you could look up for info. Like for Instagram, hashtags are good, but not everybody uses Latin. So, so I'm sure they have like hashtags mm -hmm. in Amharic that you wouldn't be able to, mm -hmm. or other languages they use. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very diverse country. So, so they might be, you know, sharing information in groups, not really like uh, in terms of journalist activists, like putting things out. Uh, I think they do have like internet connection and, and like, even if it's a shitty phone, sorry, you know, for the for my French, pardon my French, but uh, yeah, I think they are able to you know upload videos when the government doesn't cut off the internet. I'm not sure if the internet is there. So they what they really do is is they shut it down for like two weeks if they're up to something military, and uh, yeah, so it's like the, the last dynamics. And and you and I we we talked about that. It's actually that it's happening in the north. So so like people in coffee, they were like, okay, good. It's not in the southeast. Well, you know, like I, yeah. I, you know, so um, basically to kind of like summarize. What, what I've understood uh, about what, what's happening on in, in Ethiopia. Uh, so there was Haile Selassie, um, you know, Ethiopia was a monarchy and then um, it was, it was taken over by a communist revolution. And then that communist revolution kind of like took all the farms away from coffee producers. So there used to be kind of like a middle-class coffee producer um people and um you know so i met one of these guys that they lost their farm and he ended up being a taxi driver in the u.s and then as the years passed uh, there was a revolution within the revolution and so the tigray took over the revolution and this is a, a tribe from the north where you know as you approach the north it approaches sudan so it's more like a desert and as you go to the south, uh, you approach Kenya, so it's more of a forest. So most of the coffee, I would say, is in further south, so it's not really in the Tigray land. And then what, what I saw that would happen is that since it's still in theory kind of like communist, um, no one owns private lands. So uh, you rent the land from the government for like 25 years, I think. So you would be seeing all these like humongous land grants. You know, you see farms that are way bigger than in other countries. Like, you know, you ask people there, like how many hectares do you have? And it's like 2000 hectares, 4000 hectares. Mm -hmm. And it's all been assigned by the government. So, I mean, like that's an easy way to like buy 2000 hectares, right? Um, and then, you know, the, like I think when I was there, I think in 2016, like it was pretty, it was a pretty crazy time when I went is it was uh, right after the mills got burnt in Yirgachefe. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I think like, um, like a lot of the coffee importing companies don't really explain what's going on in a country. Um, first of all, it's not their role to be explaining that. Um, but I think it's also like, in order to sell the coffee, you don't really want to be talking about massacres and stuff like that hmm. but you know but what I understood was that you know the people in the south I guess like the Oromo people that grow coffee um, you know they were just sending government connected people from other areas taking over their lands and setting up these big farms and that, that's why they were angry and they were burning down the mills um, so I don't know, sorry, sorry about the monologue, but just to like, to summarize, like, so then, uh, you know, everyone thought that things were going to get better with, with the new president, because he was the first one that wasn't Tigray, and he's actually from the Oromo people. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like the Nobel Peace Prize just gets handed out a bit too early. And, you know, and it's it kind of like no one really thought it through, but this guy was like the head of... Uh, like the secret service I understood. And so he got really aggressive uh, with the Tigray people and just like invaded. And, you know, there's all these massacres and accusations going both ways. But, you know, what, what's interesting is that the, the Oromo people also took the opportunity to rise up. Um, 
you know, so now it's even his own people are like uh, revolting, revol I don't know how to say it. And um, I recently saw a post that they used an Iranian drone to bomb a village in, in, in Oromia in the south. Um, you know, so if this civil war really, you know, it seems like, you know, it, it looks like it's a country that could break down and separate into separate uh, tribal countries, right? Um, so, like, so have you seen, like, is, is there any, like, difficulty with, with the coffee this year from Ethiopia? Um, yeah, so... Not yet, but uh, yeah, what I hear there will be. So actually, so, so the production there is huge, like compared to like Central America always. So it's, it's good mm -hmm. to things in perspective. So, and you mentioned that the, the farms are huge or, you know, even the smallholders just pick a few trees. So they always get like put together at the mill. So uh, like when you have a micro lot, it might be like 300 kilos or 600 kilos. So one micro lot in Ethiopia is like one, on track or you know it's really big uh and it's very consistent in terms of production at least what i think mm -hmm. uh at the quality level they usually bring but you, you are very right that actually it's uh, the discount like it's like driven by ethnicity and like a lot of the coffee is called so it's ethiopia is a uh, is a federation uh, and a lot of the coffee regions what you mentioned Yirka Shefe or uh, you know, Sidamo. Uh, so they in what uh, in the part of country that's called uh, SNNPR is like Southern Nation Nationalist Tararam, uh, and they, they they consider foreigners like everyone. So everybody who's not Sidamo is a foreigner. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're Ethiopian. So 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 they consider themselves like uh, Sidamo, and actually like they have uh, like the constitution, uh, the federal constitution allows the uh, the bodies you know to become independent so there actually there is like a constitutional way how to become independent and some of the nationalities are looking for that that would be the case of the, the Oromo people and of these because like Sidama became a, another state like they had a referendum like people were queuing and you know voting and they would be posting it online so that we follow that uh, but actually like the government is, tries to hold the country together sort of like in a very bad way no but he's afraid you were right he's afraid um he's gonna get like uh kicked off again by the tigra uh, the dr abi ahmed how they call him so i was there like 2019 karel and martin they would be my other partners in north beans so they they traveled south in 2018 and i remember they were like uh mentioning that some of the villages they wouldn't stop there at all and like later uh, so, so it's what usually happens uh, that there's disruption. Uh, it's, it's the largest landlocked country in the world or so most populated. Mm -hmm. So the trucks are afraid to go south to pick the coffee. So you don't have the coffee because everything is milled in Addis, mm -hmm. like the dry mills. So you will have to bring the coffee from the south uh, in a truck uh, through the conflict areas to the north. Uh, so the truck drivers are afraid to go there and you don't have coffee. Uh, yeah. Uh, you don't have coffee at all. So that's most most likely what's going to happen. There will be, uh, if there's conflict, uh, there will be less coffee. Yeah, uh, and, and if they take over like the road or the train that takes them out to sea, then that, that would also... So That's so the I mean, other part, yeah, yeah. So I think that, you know, like in other places, um, you know, like, like, I don't know, I think like, Let's say if El Salvador had a had a big conflict, you could just get some Honduras or or some Guatemalan coffee or Nicaraguan. But like Ethiopia is such a big player, and it's uh, it's a lot of people's favorite coffee. Um, you know, so as, as a as a coffee producer, I sometimes like in the past, like I've even been told by an importer that you know, like why should they pay me more if they can just buy amazing cheap coffee in Ethiopia? Um, you know, so maybe like Ethiopia, it's almost like a country that brings down the price for, for everyone else. So it, it almost feels like as a coffee producer, like it's Ethiopia that's holding everyone else back by just providing all this amazing uh, affordable coffee. Then it, it, it's harder for someone from El Salvador 
to to sell their coffee like uh, you know expensive if they compare us to to Ethiopia. So, I mean, th this could have uh, quite big implications for the for the whole specialty world. No, if it, all of a sudden there's no Ethiopian coffee, or if the quality goes down because of all the conflict. Um, but they then again, I mean, you might be happy about that. What they, what well, I hear, yeah, it's, it's the coffee the, is going. Yeah, it's no, kind no, of weird it's, it's, to be happy about that. Yeah, but no, no, but it's going to be much more expensive, like for other reasons than conflict this year. What they say, so mm -hmm. that there, there's like this complex system of buying and and selling and in the government bodies involved. So they like they are introducing uh, land reform as well. So actually, you mentioned that most of the people are like. Uh, like renting the farms, but they're actually buying it now, some of them uh, at some scale. So that was one thing that Abi did in like 2020, 2019. Mm -hmm. So there's like, a, so we were, you, you said we were like a post-communist country though, like after 30 years, we, we shouldn't be putting it like that. So like people, you know, saw it like the, the early 90s, you know, like the privatization and stuff like that. So what mm -hmm. they mentioned, so we, we could relate to that. Uh, but uh, so, so the government is now imposing a minimum selling price, uh, like X warehouse uh, Addis, and I think it's much higher than two years ago. I'm not, I don't think it's completely conflict driven, uh, but sure, I mean, there's a lot more risk when you know uh, it's going to Djibouti to for for transport. Uh, I mean, they made peace with Eritrea, uh, so with they call it Asmara. So there's well, another you know, point. And, they, and it seems like Eritrea was helping out. You know, yeah, it was. And <laughs> yeah, so like they were hoping they could export through through you know Eritrea, but it never really happened. So you're still you still need to go to Djibouti, and there's a global shortage of containers, and nobody want to go to you know how how do you get containers to Ethiopia when there's conflict and and it's you know more lucrative to send them to I don't know China or whatever. So yeah. there's a lot of problems with logistics as well. Yeah, so I mean, so this is interesting with uh, that you mentioned price controls because uh, I, I, you know, I don't really know a lot about Africa, uh, but um, it seems like Kenya keeps the price kind of high, and and it's due to some sort of price control, right? Yeah, they do. I mean, they introduced it like two years. So, so like previously, all the coffees had to go through the ECX. That's the that's the auction system, uh, mm -hmm. but so, so they basically were, you know, hiding the transparency, everything had to be mixed up and then bought through the auction. It's not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. There's like a very complex system of, you know, unions being able to export coffee and- And private and, producers are able- Yeah, producers to, as well. Yes, that's part of the you're, change. If you're a big producer, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, but there, there's like, there's the, the, I'm not sure how it works actually, so sorry for the lacking details, but there is like price control. So there's like the minimum selling price and, and the government sets it every year based on, I don't know which variables, but it's a lot higher this year than the previous well, year. Yeah, so what, one of the guys we visited, and I think like, you know, there's one where, you know, there's certain points where government intervention really affects quality. And I remember that this guy, like, they had to send it to one place not like he was producing naturals so they mm -hmm. were they were able to to like dehaul in jima around the jima area mm -hmm. they would dehaul it but then they would have to send the dehauled coffee to addis ababa to get sorted you know and you just think like dirt road probably not inside grain pro um, you know, taking a long time and, uh, you know, like, is it going to lose a point or two uh, during this process? And that's just like from like government imposed like logistics that are and, you know, probably lowering the quality. Right? And you still hope they don't mix it up at the mill because the mills are huge. I mean, they're yeah, yeah. enormous. And actually what I think the government is trying to achieve here and it's like a um, I mean, it goes like beyond coffee. So because like uh, all the coffee countries growing, so so coffee is an export commodity. So it's a sort of for, a source of foreign currency. So sometimes in the coffee like countries, the, the local currency might be fluctuating. Uh, so they want to sell it in dollars. So, so they want to be paid in dollars. So all the 
you know business in Ethiopia is done in US dollars. So what the exporting companies are sometimes doing is they're trying to sell the coffee to cover their costs uh, in order to get foreign currency. And then the same company buys whatever, you know, air conditions and mobile phones and, and the people, the stuff that people want, and they import it, uh, bought with the money from coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they sell uh, the items with a high margin and that's how they make money. So the government, what I think, uh, from what I know, is trying to regulate so that uh, these companies don't sell under the cost, which, you know, is uh, hurting the producers because most mm -hmm. of the producers in Ethiopia are really like really small scale families, mm -hmm. 200 trees, you know, selling a few well, hundreds you know, of kilos. Like I, I was so, looking at, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, just a little point there about yeah. what people get paid. Um, you know, I was looking at uh, like official salaries for uh, like the garment industry, like basically sweatshops. Uh, mm -hmm. like like the official salary is ten dollars a month yeah. you know? so it's like i mean if, you, if you're drying coffee if you're like an employee just like raking you know like uh, a race bed or something they're probably getting paid even less than that you know so like as a you know as a producer from a country like el salvador where like our minimum wage is like basically approaching like the eu's minimum wage I think we're almost the same with like Bulgaria, um, <laughs> you know. What like, is it, by the way? What What's the minimum wage? Uh, like, yeah, I'm really bad with numbers, and I, I don't really remember right now. But the it's uh, it's around like three hundred something. Uh, yeah, that's for, like yeah. yeah. Um, I think like Bulgaria is like four hundred. Yeah, yeah, that's I mean, really I, like that. That's really like, comparable. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to look up look up the numbers, but basically, um, like we're we're looking at more than like you know, I don't know, like it's you know it, it makes it harder to compete when when you have like kind of like such a cheap system in other places. Uh, but it, you know, it was an interesting point what you mentioned about um, that they make their profit from the stuff that they import. Um, yeah i hadn't really thought about that yeah there's like so so whenever you come to ethiopia everybody would be mentioning they call it vertical integration that means that actually one company uh, runs the mill like the wet mill transports it to the like dry mill and then exports it so it's maybe they might be different companies owned by the same owner but mm -hmm. it's like they call it so so it's not so what they're trying to tell you that one company handles the coffee so it doesn't get lost the quality doesn't get mixed up and they can guarantee from you know from cherry to bag that everything is going to be all right so but these companies have to be big uh, you know they have a lot of money and there's like i mean even like the, the number of people you know every washing station so has like a thousand people that bring in cherry so if it, it's not like uh, unusual that one company owns like 10 you know washing stations mm -hmm. so there's like ten thousand people actually picking coffee and getting paid somehow so these companies you know they they, they are large cash operations it's not like uh uh, very small so they some of them are you know doing coffee just as a side business and some of them are more involved in coffee and they like when they're doing good and i mean like really good so they're like actually like paying the farmers they are setting up their bank accounts and paying them like officially they're, they're they're you know launching their like social security schemes because it's i mean even in bulgaria you would get it like for sure but not uh in Ethiopia mm -hmm. so they're educating them to you know be involved in the banking system and uh, you know paying them extra on the like after the crop so so they get prepaid when they you know deliver the cherries yeah the and two after payments. the sales they yeah. do payment system yeah, yeah. so yeah, that's which yeah, some I mean like you know the second one is like yeah whatever dude <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah um but uh you know, so so something that's interesting, like analyzing these situations, um, <clears throat> it sort of seems that Latin America has a lot more rights than these uh, African countries, in a way. Because uh, you know, like I was I was really surprised, like um, like visiting visiting Rwanda, where um, they kind of you know. So what I understood was that people back like they're you know Rwanda's pretty dry um 
And then through colonialism, they planted a lot of eucalyptus that even dries up the land even more. Um, so it's hard to do, you know, wash coffee when you don't have access to water. So a lot of like small producers were doing like kind of like low grade semi wash with and this was back in the commercial days, which was probably it was probably like a sweet kind of like honey style. But since the parchment looked dirty or whatever, back in the day, that was like penalized. Um, and so and so like a way for Rwanda to raise quality was to like set up uh, wet mills and they sort of like it's not an obligation to deliver to that wet mill but basically wet mills have regional monopolies you know so a producer is basically kind of like you're almost obligated to deliver to that wet mill there um i mean you could you know you could walk to the next wet mill but like people don't have cars so like how are you going to drag all this cherry to the next wet mill so it's basically a kind of like regional monopoly and then it, it, like what i learned was that you know these um these regional mills they would set the price for the season and then that that's it right so you know so when when I, when I think of like being a coffee producer if someone would tell me like hey you don't have the right to process your own coffee you know i i I would probably like start a revolution or something, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, it's sort of, I guess like it's happened here in El Salvador in the past. Like, I mean, like here it was basically the government that basically destroyed coffee production. Um, you know, because like, like in the late seventies, we were like the fourth largest producer in the world um and the third largest exporter and um i think we we were producing like four million quintals which are 100 pound units uh and you know all the mills were projecting that we were going to grow to seven million but then we had like a young generation of idealistic military people taking over the government and they nationalized uh, the private banks and they nationalized like the large farms, like they just took the whole farm and divided it up. And then like what really messed with things, and I can see it with my own family, um, was that they they forbade us from exporting. You know, so imagine like, let's say like my family, you know, we, we have been in coffee since like the mid 1800s. And, you know, we had really wow. solid, solid relationships with like, let's say like our German buyers, you know, like, um, like my, my dad tells me like stories of like Mr. Neumann being a young man and coming to his house and like doing deals with his father. And, you know, and this grew into like the Neumann group, like uh, Inter-American. And they were just like very solid relationships of like decades of selling to the same client and uh, having like a solid brand that was well known and recognized and that you would get paid better just from having this good reputation. And then all of a sudden being forced to, to like sell the coffee to the government at a fixed price. Uh, so a mill basically then there was no motivation to produce better coffee to do a good job if you just were forced to sell it to the government. And I think that made a lot of people like stop investing in coffee. You know, and I, I see that with like my mom's generation that no one in the family went into coffee, you know, so just the, the government made it unattractive to, to invest in coffee. And that, you know, so it's just like, all these kind of like unstable, like let's say third world uh, governments really messing with producers. And, uh, you know, just like, just like one would hope to just have some stability, you know. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting how like politics can really mess, mess with coffee production. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what I think like that this El Salvador is really interesting so, you, you know, we discussed the book, you know, Coffee Lands uh, that's written on El Salvador. 
Uh, it's which I, like which I haven't story. read. I downloaded yeah, it. Uh, actually, yeah. like with all the respect to the author, uh, it's very academical. It's really like boring to read. So you really, I mean, that's a lot of, you know, you have to read the whole so, so, so you understand the point. So it's like at the very end that it starts making sense. Uh, but it's on El Salvador. So, what, so, so I learned about, a lot on, about the history of the country uh, besides what we, you know, talk uh, about. So that's always very interesting to us as well to hear from your family because it's really i mean if it's the mid 1800s it's really uh, it's a family history of growing coffee like uh, uh very respectful uh and very uh, you know and, you know the data remains in the family i think the peak was 1979 it's also the peak uh peak of the coffee like on, on the sea market uh, like the price of coffee i think was the highest in 1979 so mm -hmm. not only it fell through the not only it fell through the you know uh, civil war because it was a uh, I think one of the longest ones in Central America uh, mm -hmm. in El Salvador it was like more than ten years maybe like I don't know fifteen years maybe uh, yeah like the start is kind of hazy because like at yeah. the beginning they were kind of not so serious they were just kind of kidnapping people yeah yeah so, yeah, but, yeah but the, then it fell down I mean when I was really so the specialty coffee usually brings like positive message like i mean people you know they they're not able to sell their coffee at a competitive price because they're you know bullied by some sorts of monopolies or cooperatives or it's very complex so so they you know they're selling the coffee under the price of the production so only the elderly remain in the coffee the kids wonder why why they stay in that and specialty coffee should bring in like the uh bring in like the the new way how to do it which i think for for some people really does and it's really great that we we're able to pay the prices and, and and we're happy to pay the prices for the quality produced uh though now i see like with more experience that producers are always interesting in selling volume as well not not the best lot you know 300 super kgs but the, the main part of the production so that's i think a new quest for for people in specialty to find ways how to you know support the producers with the broader variety or broader variety like broader range of the product they actually produce uh but mm, like I, I wrote a piece on uh, Salvador for for the magazine I write for and I was like really wondering like I was like stunned that, like the production already collapsed in El Salvador it's not like I mean it revived its specialty it's still like going down I mean uh, the production might be a little higher than a few years ago but it's like one quarter than it what used to be, maybe even less. So that's I was like really. That's like that. it's like one one eighth. What what it used maybe to be. even like that? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's really. Yeah, you know, I think like something that um, affects El Salvador is that I I guess here we had you know so we we had like two hundred thousand approximately two hundred thousand Europeans uh, moved to El Salvador between eighteen eighty and nineteen twenty. And, and so, you know, for a small country, that's like a huge percentage. Yeah. And it was these Europeans that, you know, it was after independence. Uh, so it was kind of like from other countries that were not Spain. So like Italian, Swiss, Germans uh, coming here. Um, and so, you know, they weren't like the exploitative, uh, you know, in, at least like initially, like they weren't like the old Spanish high class. Mm -hmm. They were like poor Germans coming here and just like struggling and um, you know like I'll give you an example of like uh, I guess like my mom's family in Catalonia you would call them Batja but like here it became Batle uh, so like the Batle family um, you know this guy was like a poor bread maker you know and he came to El Salvador you know got into coffee I guess like I, I don't even know if like the bread making uh, help them ferment better coffee but you know hmm. like they, they set up a mill it grew you know so these were like poor people that came here and just kind of thrived because maybe they had a competitive advantage even though they were poor Catalans they probably had a little bit more education than the local people um, you know and then I guess Europeans doing deals with Europeans like they kind of helped each other rise um, I, I forget what the point of this was, but ah, okay. Yeah. So, 
basically like El Salvador kind of set up a more industrial system where you had big centralized industrialized mm -hmm. mills. Um, so I guess like people here kind of have a better idea of what their costs are when, you know, when you're a big company at, or a big farm, you might be doing a little bit better accounting than if you're like a small producer doing subsistence farming. Um, you know, so what I'm getting at is that like, let's say if you're like, let's say like the small producer country is kind of like Colombia. Uh, if you live in your small farm of four hectares, uh, you, you don't really have an idea if you're really making money or not with coffee. You know, you're just like kind of like selling it and then paying for your food and, you know, and then you have some other crop or something. But like, let's say like, like my dad, he's a um, like he's a PhD in, in, in economics or in finance. I, I don't know. But, you know, so he's like, like a PhD with all these numbers and stuff. So like in the, in the late, like in the early 2000s, when coffee prices were really low, um, like he sold his biggest farm, you know, because it was just like, what, what, what's the point of growing coffee if it's not profitable and I can just invest my money in something else? So, you know, he like he wasn't romantic about it. He just sold his, his biggest farm and like went into real estate and other stuff with the sale. Um, you know, so I think like, I guess like the more educated you are, the quicker you realize that being a coffee producer doesn't really doesn't really pay well. Like I, th I think like with me, um, I, it's more of a passion project. Um, I see the history of my family. I kind of like the challenge. And I think like, sorry for kind of like blowing my own horn, but I think that, you know, like you should have smart people in farming as well, because like not every smart person should be doing startups with like tech fantasies. And, you know, I kind of like the whole concrete thing of, um, you know, like I grow something and I have the challenges of uh, climate change and, you know, I have to develop new varieties and see how I survive, like moving away from chemicals and incorporating microorganisms. And so, so I see it as a challenge, but it's really not like financially rewarding, I guess, un unless you're, you're really like just producing geishas that allow you to sell at a huge margin above your cost of production. Um, you know, like to give you an example, like I'm, I'm losing money with uh, my low elevation farm, Lombardia. You know, I like, you know, it's, uh, there's just not enough productive branches to produce enough coffee to cover the costs. And if I don't invest in the farm, I'm never gonna bring it out of losing. You know, so I, so I know that I'm, I'm going to be losing money with this farm for at least the next two or three years, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm able to pay for that, uh, partly because like Finca El Salvador is profitable and I'm breaking my father's rules because, uh, you know, like my, my father would manage each farm as an individual business. Uh, so if Lombardia wasn't producing money, then he wasn't like investing more into it. And I guess that's how it got abandoned. And, and I'm kind of like more of an idealist. And I guess like, like having my own importing company uh, and, you know, I sell Brazilian coffee, Colombian coffee, like that allows me to invest more in my farm than I would be able to if I was just a producer. Um, you know, so it's kind of, it's kind of weird because then, if I would just be a producer, I would have probably had to abandon Lombardia already. Um, you know, so, so I guess like that, that's why I set up my importing company because it, it just seemed that like you make money on the other side, not, not on the producing side that much. Yeah. So, well, like that's a very interesting thing. I didn't know that. Uh, it's the thing is that you actually since it's a low elevation farm, it's really, I mean, that, that's the struggle you mentioned with climate change. I mean, especially in Central America, from what I hear that, you know, 
gets really dry and and the seasons are unpredictable. So, mm. uh, so good luck with that. Uh, we're happy <laughs> to to no, I got, but I, I mean it. I mean that's like uh, uh, you should invest sometimes in in futile projects. Uh, make them, you know, and then when you make them profitable, I think you can be really proud of yourself because you change something in the society. And I'm sure you know people who who work for Lombardia. I mean, they have a new job opportunity. So. Mm. It's really something I, I think is uh, necessary, but then again, yeah, it's always like different, I, I think with people with different backgrounds, like with uh, when they're really good at, you know, accounting, so they have a different approach when I think you're uh, like more, uh, your education is more like, uh, how to put it, like more into humanities and, and, and social sciences sort of. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like more liberal, liberal, that's what I wanted to say. Mm. Uh, so uh so yeah so that that might be conflicting approaches to things i mean one thing that we like uh what i always uh tell our like employees and people i talk about coffee is that like you always talk about sustainable coffee um sustainable is that you actually you guys make money and we guys make money uh, like we make money on the coffee but sustainable means pay more to the farmer so he can afford you know to repair the roof and actually invest into innovation i mean there's a lot i see a lot of room to you know in in like agriculture innovation practices like using the data from the farms actually follow follow the weather patterns you know adjust to that so yeah. So, well, you know, like spe speaking, that might be the that. way how to get effective, you know, getting actually, you know, the data and try to adjust based on the data. Yeah. Well, but sure, I, I don't want to, you're in charge of your business, you know. Well, you know, I, I, I think like the, the big limit here is like the topography. So, like with current technology, we're not going to be able to do machine picking here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I, I guess like that's one of the reasons why. I'm kind of like afraid of, um, you know, expanding Finca El Salvador. It's like Finca El Salvador is doing well. It's like higher elevation. There's less uh, plagues and stuff like that. Um, you know, and like by now I'm getting like more requests uh, for that coffee that I could like expand the farm. But then I, I think like, where am I going to find the people to pick this coffee? You know? Like, uh, you know, because right now, like at the peak of harvest, like we, we might need like 90, 90 people, That's uh, 90 persons, you know, and it's like, you know, nowadays, like who, who wants to pick coffee? You know, I mean, it, it's kind of like a big payday, uh, like people, you know, from around there, like they want to pick coffee because like they, they make a bit more money, but as, you know, as young people emigrate, uh, to the U.S. or to the big towns, like who the hell is gonna like pick coffee? So it just sort of seems like I should just have a small farm that I can manage and like just keep it that way. It's just like climate change and like lack of people, you know. So I'm trying to come up with like creative solutions. Like we're talking about setting up like an agricultural school, um, stuff like that, but. You know, it's sort of like you have to juggle all these things to just uh, be able to do what was easy to do back in the day. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm, I guess uh, we're just like kind of like on a random, <laughs> random thought right now. Um, yeah, I mean, but it's really, I mean, well, we have been talking about it for a year now uh what you've been up to or actually what you've been considering like around Lombardia or in think El Salvador and how to set up the community of people actually you know knowing how how the coffee is consumed here in Europe which I think is really nice or actually it's like uh I always like it I mean like I'm like speaking of Cameroon just once more so mm -hmm. what, what Mati is one of the things he's doing he's actually like introducing roasted coffee as a luxury product for for the farmers like something they would do on the on a Sunday evening mm -hmm. uh, you know maybe buy with, with a bit of honey because they like honey so I like to see the connection uh between the producer and uh, or the pickers I mean they're they're the hands on on our coffee and uh, people actually so so they know how the coffee is consumed and on the other hand, yeah. I guess it, this is a good uh, moment to kind of, sorry if it's a bit dirty, it's been here for a while. Uh, 
you signed it for yourself. That's really nice. Yeah. No, I made you do that. Yeah, I know. But yeah, I mean, it's like uh, we're trying to talk about the pickers. I mean, that that so so people know that actually coffee is picked by hand. And if the pickers know how people consume it in Europe, then the connection is that's something that you you're not really able to you know, like count or express financially, but it makes a nice community around uh, the product. So yeah, we're very happy your father didn't, ah, oh, nice dog. Oh, it's, it's, it's the one, oh, it's the, the coffee breed. Hmm? It's really well-trained now. Uh, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it's nice. Sorry, to sorry I, lost that, I lost the Cameroon point. So it's like, he's getting the pickers to drink specialty coffee so that they learn the farmers they're not really pickers they're okay, like farmers, farmers but you do that too so yeah. so i know maybe i never mentioned it but you, you do that too actually like mm -hmm. set up a small community of you know of the, the farm workers so they have the v60s and and they're trying to like drink coffee as well or maybe it's like an early stage but uh, i know about the idea so that's something i think uh, like makes sense for the people yeah, put, um, put, put things in dance. context, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, That's it, what I it mean. helps. Yeah. yeah, it helps uh, people know, like, you you know, if you just tell someone do this, but it, but if you actually, like, you know, they understand the reasons why and they see the difference. But, you know, but it's kind of like to, to mention some of that, it's kind of funny because, um, like, yesterday we had one of our first cuppings of the season. Uh, you know, so we start cupping the low elevation lots that get picked up. Uh, first and you know so like here i have uh this is the first time we're separating varieties from lombardia so this is a yellow katura mm -hmm. specialty picking from lombardia and then this is like the generic picking you know so it's like uh trees that maybe the root system isn't working so well so the plant's not going to mature uh to fully ripe beans so we end up like picking it semi-ripe before they dry because like you know dry shriveled up cherries are worth uh less than like semi-ripe cherries so you know the the trees that are not going to arrive all the way to full maturity due to like the problems we have with plagues at low elevations we end up picking we call it generic like non-specialty and uh you know, and coffee is kind of weird because uh, so this cup, you know, we were cupping blind and like this one, it, it cupped better than the specialty picking of Lombardia. <laughs> you know, it was, it was like a bit like more like red fruits. And then, and then you're just like, oh, okay, yeah. all the effort to pick ripe and then this shit tastes better. Um, you know, coffee gives you those surprises that I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, funny thing so you know so i'm drinking the the generic uh, yeah so the generic and so 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 it's like fresh harvest fresh roasted fresh brewed so it's like from yesterday all within like one day or something like that yeah yeah i got like it finished drying this week i kind of you know i kind of like coffee like this it's sort of like you know how they say that like the best wine is is drank at the at the winery um yeah, it could be yeah. it could be yeah yeah. Uh, yes, you seem to be happy or at least amused with the result. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like it's so I, like up until this year, I was just, you know, well, like last year was my first year managing Lombardia. Uh, mm -hmm. and my dad retired. Um, so this year is like the first year that we actually like separate varieties. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's a farm at 950 meters. So the, the cup's going to be a bit wow. limited. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, you know, so we separated the Bourbon and we did a 120 hour maceration, like cherry, I guess like other people would call it anaerobic. And that's actually pretty, pretty good, you know, but then we're going to see what happens with the Sarchimor hybrid. Uh, we're mm -hmm. also doing 120, but that one uh, matures later. So I don't have a sample yet, but the results from the Bourbon are really nice. But then, you know, the Bourbon's the one that's like dying from leaf rust and all these other plagues. Um, you know, so it's going to be like right now I'm switching all the plants. Like I might leave a small section of Bourbon, 
but I'm planting tabi and portillo, which are like, it's like a local variety. From Colombia? Uh, yeah, I brought tabi from Colombia and those plants are like super aggressive, like, it, mm -hmm. like boom, you know, like boxers. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, but you know, so I guess like that's like my last hope for Lombardia. Like if the tabi doesn't grow well there, then I just have to give up on coffee unless I want to grow Robusta. You know, but that's why like, you know, my goal with Lombardia is to like in five years, get 25% of the sales from something that's not coffee. Um, you know, so I'm planting cacao, I'm planting hibiscus. Um, you know, like we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, but uh, I mean, yeah, it's like one thing people don't really know. Uh, so I'm going to like you know, mention it that actually like uh, coffee grows, I don't know, three years uh, before it starts, you know, giving fruit. So mm -hmm. before the first harvest actually occurs. So it's really hard to, you know, invest into something or, you know, try something new because the first uh, moment you see a result of what you're doing is like in three years time. And when it goes bad, you go like, OK, I'm going to change something and then wait for another three years. So uh, it's it's yeah. hard to, you know, it's it's like uh, it's not like you have like uh, plenty of opportunities. You're going to try the tabby now. You wait. And when it doesn't go where you plan, it's not like you're going to wait for another three years. I mean, so that's yeah, you really get tough old, for, for old waiting for varieties <laughs> to grow. Yeah. Uh, have you been trying like the you know, like the hybrid varieties, like the F1 or, you know, the, those from like the World well, Coffee you know, Research. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what coffee, World Coffee Research does. Like, um, I mean, they, they have a center here, but it's inside a, a big mill. Um, I mean, it's not like, I, I don't know where to get those plants. You know, I've written to them on social media and they don't answer. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. like, it's nice to see that they're doing these projects, but as a farmer and I guess like a kind of semi-capable farmer, uh, I don't I don't really know where to buy the World Coffee Research varieties or like how do I get access to them? Um, you know, so I guess like what, I, what I'm planting are the, the interesting trees that I've found, like, you know, just walking around farms in different countries, you know, so yeah, I, I don't even know if they work like at the lower elevation. So like the, the F1 is really nice. I, I've had some from Costa Rica, cupping like, you know, uh, kind of high, like, uh, and they're, they're easier to reproduce. So it's not like they grow from seeds. So it's it's done the other way. So it's uh, it's easier to, you know, grow the plants and, and change things. And well, But well, I'm not yeah, sure I mean, if they're suited yeah. for low elevation. Yeah, I'm yeah sure so I mean, it's kind of weird because like, so F1 is just like a standard. And so it's, I don't know if they're calling a variety F1, but like F1 would usually be like the first, the first generation. Yeah. Right? So like the first generation is really unstable. So you can't really replant seeds from the F1 because it would regress to one of the parent plants. So I guess like that puts you in kind of like a system where like you depend on them to resupply you uh, plants. Which, yeah, I, I need which is kind of like a scary, you know, because there you get into like the whole like Monsanto um, hmm. registered seed that you cannot like replant yourself because it's patented. Um, you know, so I'm glad like with coffee, we can still kind of like, it's sort of like this underground of like sneaking seeds around and trading mm -hmm. seeds with <laughs> friends from other countries. Um, you know, but that's probably like, you know, like you just have to wait a few years because like, you know, I have some Ethiopian varieties growing, some Colombian varieties. Um, yeah, but it's kind of like the the coffee underground of seed sharing. Oh, but it's like always interesting, like from Rosa's perspective, it's really interesting like to buy, you know, Ethiopian coffee variety from El Salvador somewhere. That's really interesting. And I mean, when you grow it, I mean, it's in good hands. So. That's, I mean, I wouldn't buy it like because just because of that. But if I know the producer, mm -hmm. then, then it's really interesting yeah, to experiment. Well, I mean, you know, the one that's really interesting right now is um, the, you know, mislabeled uh, pink Bourbon from Huila, which is like yeah. not, not a Bourbon, yeah. um, you know, but some American dude called it pink Bourbon without knowing what it was. And the name stuck. 
you know, so here we're going to call it or orange huila because we do have quite a few Bourbons and right. you know, this thing doesn't look at all like a Bourbon, but I mean, it's amazing. Like the second year, it's already full of cherries. So it cups well, it produces early, you know, so that, that's going to be a very, very interesting, like floral, fruity coffee. Um, you know, so I think that that's one of the most interesting things about like being a coffee producer, like that, you know, we have this very limited genetics and, and we want to like, you know, expand the genetic um, availability. And it's all through like finding this tree or that one and then, you know, waiting a few years. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, we're kind of like we already talked for an hour. Um, and it's kind of rambling. So what, what would be a good way to end this? Uh, well, like with some hope, it's always good to end with some hope. So uh, I hope you're some hope for El Salvador. Like, I mean, even if it's not profitable. So I hope the Lombardia project goes good. Uh, it becomes profitable for you. It makes sense. So uh, I hope you never sell in El Salvador. Mm. And yeah, I hope like producing coffee makes sense for you and brings you good living. I mean, that that's that's what it's supposed to do and i mean we're buying only a fraction of what you produce so it's always has to be a network of people who think alike and mm. um it's good you yeah, know but, yeah like uh you know what i think what's uh what's allowed us to go forward is relationships like what we have uh with you and nord beans that um you know we're able to sell direct to you guys so we you know all, all that we get paid we can reinvest in the farms you know and it's something that would be hard if there's more middlemen involved i would be getting paid less um so yeah i mean like you guys support us and if there wouldn't be an interest in specialty coffee then i would probably be out of coffee right yeah so i mean let's uh let's hope for the best with uh you know, let's hope for the best with uh, your efforts and um yeah, so I'm not sure if that's the way how to end it, but uh, yeah, uh, it's a good, I mean, a good yeah. one. I mean, yeah, I mean, thanks yeah. for having me, by the way. Uh, it's really appreciated. So I'm not sure. Um, yeah, we'll see whether actually, you know, people will you know, be interested on in what I had to say. But it was a nice yeah. talk for me, you know, it's nice talking to you, uh, spending yeah. uh, some time across two continents. I mean, it's great that we can do this. Actually, wouldn't be able to do it like 20 years ago. So it's good there's connection you know well, and it's us. a it's a first try so uh, we can have other talks in the future and uh yeah yeah I'll, yeah i'll be happy to you know listen to other guys from different i mean you work for with very interesting like group of people so always very interesting perspectives and i'll be happy to you know uh be a viewer or a listener of, of the future episodes so good mm -hmm. luck with this uh project as well yeah thanks for your time Yaramid. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Rodolfo. Ch check out Nord Beans. Yeah, check out Rodolfo. It's our Christmas coffee. So next season, we bought so many bags that we're going to have this coffee for a few years now. And it, it's like a very, it's great coffee and it's it's good to, you know, it, it's fun as well. So Rodolfo is our, you know, it's, it's a bestseller. <laughs> awesome, dude. All right. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye. Yeah.